Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to members of our virtual audience, wherever you are in the world. I'm Doug Silliman, the president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and I want to welcome you today to AGSIW's discussion of the impact of the Hamas attack on Israel, on the Gulf, and on the recent trend toward de-escalation and reconciliation in the broader region. The Middle East over the past three years has seen a wave of de-escalation and attempts at reconciliation. The Abraham Accords brought normalization or closer relations between four Arab governments and Israel. Saudi Arabia and earlier the UAE reestablished relations with Iran, and serious talks have been underway to end the war in Yemen. Even the United States and Iran have engaged in indirect negotiations to recast the Iran nuclear deal and secure the release of five Americans who were in Iranian custody. For the optimistic, this period showed how negotiations and compromise might lower tensions in the region. However, on the morning of October 7th, Hamas launched a coordinated, coordinated series of brutal attacks from Gaza into Israel, attacking both military outposts and ordinary Israeli civilians. More than 1,000 Israelis are reportedly dead. Israeli counterstrikes into Gaza have reportedly resulted in more than 1,000 dead in Gaza as well, including civilians. U.S. President Joe Biden quickly condemned the Hamas attacks as terrorism and pure evil and pledged the full support of the United States for Israel, including the facilitation of weapons shipments to replenish Israeli stocks and the deployment of a U.S. Navy carrier battle group to the region as a deterrent to regional escalation. Hamas officials claim that their successful attacks have changed the rules of the game in their fight against Israel. And Israel appears poised on the verge of a major land assault on Gaza. And Israeli officials have pledged to eliminate Hamas from that territory. What then will happen to the era of de-escalation and reconciliation? Today, we will discuss the broader regional implications of these hostilities particularly in the Gulf. What are the attitudes and actions we can expect from Gulf governments? Will Gulf governments alter the way that they deal with Palestinians? As a result of the Hamas attacks, will they change the way they deal with Israel or the United States? How do Gulf populations view the conflict? Was in Iran involved in the Hamas attacks? And if we think they are, how do we know and what do they do? And our core question today, Will the violence affect what has been a growing trend of de-escalation and reconciliation in the Gulf? How will it affect the Abraham Accords and trilateral discussions between the United States, Israel, and Saudi Arabia? We have collected a big part of AGSIW's brain trust this morning to tackle these questions for you. Ali Alfone is senior fellow at AGSIW and covers Iran for us. He produces the Iran Media Review, a twice-weekly analysis of important issues in the Iranian Farsi language press. You can find his work and sign up for the Iran Media Review at agsiw.org. Dr. Kristen smith Duan is a senior resident scholar at AGSIW. Her current work focuses on generational change, nationalism, and the evolution of Islamism in the countries of the GCC. And Dr. Hussein Ibish is a senior resident scholar at AGSIW. He's a weekly columnist for The National and a frequent contributor to The New York Times, The Daily Beast, and many other U.S. and international publications. Hussein, if I can, let me begin with you. Could you please put the Hamas attacks and the Israeli response into the regional context for us? Um, sure. Uh, let me just say that uh, I know we're going to talk a, a more, especially when Ali comes in, about Iran's role. But there's no doubt Iran has re-emerged uh, once again as Hamas's main international sponsor and backer. Uh, during the decade after the Arab Spring uprisings between 2010 and 2018, 19, uh, there was a, a sectarian split in the region, particularly over the war in Syria, and Hamas uh, you know, drifted very far away from the Iranian orbit. But uh, in the past five or six years, um, all of that has changed, and the sectarian divide in the region is greatly attenuated. The war in Syria is over, and Hamas has drifted much closer back into the Iranian sphere. And the reason I mention this 
is that it's not really possible to understand the calculations without understanding the interests of both Hamas and also Iran in this, because they they overlap, but they're distinct. And I, I want to look at that because it, 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 you know, the impact of this conflict on regional dynamics is going to depend on what happens. And so I want to talk about scenarios, right? Because that's the only way really to look at it right now. What Hamas, what motivated Hamas domestically, and and they have many reasons, um, was first and foremost, a sense of dread about the impact of a uh, a Saudi-Israeli rapprochement and all of the benefits of a significant Palestinian component, TM, uh, SPC, that uh, the administration has been pushing for, whatever it was, and it certainly was going to include lots of money from Saudi Arabia for Fatah and the PA, all of the benefits would have gone to Hamas's arch rivals, Fatah and the PA, uh, including money, including more, probably more control, including uh, things they could take credit for regarding settlements and annexation and whatever it was that Palestinians were going to get, it wasn't going to go to Hamas. And it might have revived arguments by uh, the PLO that their diplomatic strategy is ultimately the only one that gains anything, even if it's incremental, slow, I- I- insufficient, but at least there's something. And Hamas has come up with nothing. So that that I think was a big fear. In addition, the Israel, this Israeli government has been really ratcheting up pressure on Palestinians generally. They've been tightening the grip on Gaza. They have uh, cracked down hugely on Palestinian prisoners in Israel. There have been all of these provocations at the Al-Aqsa Mosque with more and more Jewish visitors changing the understood agreement from the middle of the 19th century about control. And uh, these raids inside the West Bank and these fighting between Israel and these uh, unaffiliated armed youth groups like the Lion's Den, which again puts a lot of pressure on Palestinians. Well, I think it became very clear to Hamas that the status quo in Gaza no longer served their interests, that they had to, to, to break out, and that in doing so, they might as well do a Hail Mary attempt at seizing control of the Palestinian national movement from the PA and the PLO once and for all, consigned Fatah to, to the uh, footnotes of history, etc. So I think those were their main goals. They want to disrupt the status quo. They don't want Israel to go back to the way things were, the status quo ante. And I think it's clear they've laid a trap. They want the Israelis to counterattack. They have prepared for uh, months or years this incursion into southern Israel, and there's no way they haven't prepared a response to the almost inevitable Israeli counterattack. So they're waiting. They're waiting and saying, come on in, come in the briar patch. Come on in. Come on in, Br'er Rabbit. You know, and and uh well, they're Br'er Rabbit. That's the idea. Come on, come on in, you know, Fox, Br'er Fox. Um Iran, I think, is very fearful of the strategic implications of the US bringing together uh, its main uh, partners in the region, its main military partner, Israel, and the big financial oil and religious partner, Saudi Arabia. And that would then create this network of, of bilateral relations throughout the region that I've described many times. I'm not going to bore people with it now. So these are the aims, right? Now, will the main question for regional uh, dynamics, and especially for whether uh, Saudi Arabia could go forward at any point in the foreseeable future in negotiations with Israel and the impact of this conflict on the era of of de-escalation or what I've called um, con- uh, you know uh, consolidation retrenchment and maneuver which is a more detailed word for de-escalation or term for de-escalation um, depends on what happens right so there's sort of different scenarios one is that this is contained to Gaza and that Israel either doesn't come back and occupy Gaza, or it does, and that that then produces a different set of cascading events, but it's contained. And under such circumstances, I do think then that the era of de-escalation can continue in the rest of the Middle East, even though this is going to increase tensions, but it can survive a conflict that's limited to Gaza. So can Saudi negotiations with Israel, though it may be destabilizing enough, uh, because even if it's contained to Gaza, it still rejiggers all the calculations in the strategic landscape, such that Saudi Arabia needs time to consider 
um, costs and benefits in the new context. Okay. The second scenario is what if it spreads? I think the first goal of Hamas and, and Iran in this case is for the fighting to spread into the West Bank and ideally occupied East Jerusalem. This thing has been branded from the beginning as the Al-Aqsa deluge, right? It's already called Al-Aqsa. They've got, they've, they're waving the flag of Jerusalem or now the Quds already. So that's where they would like the fighting to go. Whether it, it does spread or not, whether the PA can keep a lid on things, very much remains to be seen. And who would take the fight to Israel in the West Bank is a big open question. These ultimately uh, pale in comparison to the idea of the war spreading to Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah has had some limited skirmishes with Israel, all within the accepted rules of engagement that have been established between the parties happening in Shabbat Farms and nothing too dramatic. Some Lebanese were killed. Some one Israeli officer was killed. It's, it's nothing that the situation can't handle. But um, we could come to a point, especially if Al-Aqsa comes into play and the West Bank and Jerusalem come into play, where it becomes impossible for Hezbollah to resist getting involved and where the Quds force simply orders them to act. And I think we know from the experiences in Syria that Hezbollah's independence from the Quds force is really very limited. And if the Quds force insists Hezbollah could get involved. It may well be that Iran would prefer to keep Hezbollah as a deterrent and that Hezbollah is an effective deterrent as it is now and is better used that way, especially if the fighting doesn't spread into the West Bank. However, uh, just because Hezbollah needs a war with Israel right now, like they need congestive heart failure because of the situation in Lebanon, and they really, really, really don't want to do it, they still could get drawn in. There are a number of scenarios that draw them in. That then produces the worst scenario for regional um, de-escalation and for uh, everything that you've been talking about, Doug, which would be a situation in which Israel finds itself bogged down in a multi-front war to the south, to the uh, east in the West Bank and Jerusalem, and to the north in um, Lebanon, and maybe even to the Golan Heights as well. And at that point, Israel might feel compelled to say, look, we are surrounded by these Palestinian hornets and this Lebanese cobra. Uh, we need to take this to the real source. We need to go to the, the zookeeper in, in Tehran. We need to hit this the, our enemies where they live and where they really live is in Iran. That's at least what they would tell them themselves. And at that point, I think it could become an obviously fantastically destabilizing regional war. So there are your basic scenarios. It's a lot more complicated, but I'll end with that. Hussein, thank you. Um, Kristen, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the Gulf is seeing this new outbreak of violence and some a bit about how the Gulf media and social media is covering this since it seems to be significantly different from what we are seeing in the United States and Europe and the West in general. Sure, thank you, Ambassador. Um, well, let me start just by underlining something that Hussein said, which is that um, I think we're all wrestling with the events as they're emerging. Um, we've seen this Hamas attack as unprecedented um, in the sense that, you know, they've actually broken through the Gaza barrier and attacked, you know, these civilian populations, um, taken hostages. Um and I'll underline that, of course, this is just very early days. And as Hussein said, there's a lot to come out, emerge from this. Um, so I think when I'm looking at this question, uh, I'm asking myself, and I think we're all asking ourselves, um, you know, are we in a completely different universe now? Um, can we use prior iterations of the Israel-Hamas confrontation as a model for sort of current behavior and outcome? Are we in just completely new ground here? So I've been trying to sort of look at the statements and compare them somewhat to um, things that emerged in the last um, uh, significant Israel-Hamas confrontation, which is the 2021 um, confrontation that started, of course, in the Jerusalem region, actually, with the Sheikh Jarrah expulsions and the Al-Aqsa incursion, and then was followed by this Israel-Hamas exchange of rocket fire. Um, 
And so I think when we look at that, the the initial goal statement, um, I think we're probably pretty jarring to a lot of sort of Western audiences uh, and their sort of direct support for the Palestinians and um, reluctance or not condemning the actions that the Palestinians had taken against the Israelis. I think we saw in subsequent statements um, a little more space uh, opening up then between the Abraham Accord states with um, the UAE actually coming out and explicitly condemning that. Um, but I think by now, with some of the follow up uh, statements that have been made, we can see them, um, all the Gulf states to some extent, and I'll get into some of the differences, coalescing around a con- common, more common position of condemning attacks on civilians kind of more broadly or wanting to see more protection of civilians and calling for de-escalation, which is, I think, a more comfortable position for them um, to be in. Uh, There's some distinctions with uh, Qatar, which kind of issued probably the strongest sort of uh, support for the Palestinians initially um, and is now positioning itself very much as a negotiator uh, due to their kind of privileged position of relations with Hamas, of course, even Hamas members, significant Hamas members, somewhat at least part-time in residence in Qatar. Um, so I think they're very much trying to show that uh, right now as an asset that they can use to help in the situation by mediating for the release of, of hostages. Um, but of course, that's going to be a point, uh, I would think, moving into the future where that could be a very difficult point for Qatar having these ties. So that's one important distinction. Um, if we look at, but so there at least we see um, some similarity and a little bit of distinction between the Abraham Accord states and the and the other states, but all kind of coming around the, peer, the situation of de-escalation now. If we look at civil society, Again, I think in some ways it looks sort of similar to what we saw before, and I, I think it's easier to see civil society actions in the states that have stor- historically had uh, more active civil society and organized civil society, which is Bahrain and, and Kuwait. There we can see demonstrations taking place um, in Shia villages and in front of the Kuwaiti parliament in support of the Palestinians explicitly. Um, we've seen formal statements by opposition uh, civil societies or, or just civil societies, sorry, political societies. Um, in Kuwait, interestingly, a unified statement that came from both what we would consider kind of more leftist uh, or nationalist and Islamist positions and support, strong support for the Palestinians. Um, and in Bahrain, we saw statements, split statements with the now illegal um, Shia opposition movements issuing statements and uh, the clergy issuing statements, strong support of Palestinians, but also the other political civil societies issuing statements, which is interesting, of course, because Bahrain is a Abraham Accord signer. But these societies did put out statements in support of the Palestinians. Um, one other thing, too, uh, that I noticed is that uh, oh, of, of also the Kuwaiti parliament, 45 members of the 50 parliamentary members also put out a formal statement in support of the Palestinians. Um, And individual parliamentary members in Bahrain have continued to put that on their kind of social media feeds, support for for Palestinians. Um, So again, I think we see, uh, at least in these states, you can see that the opening or distance of some between the positions of states and the positions of civil society, um, which is again, common to what we saw before. Uh, there's one can, other thing. Can, that I ask, I, can I ask Kristen a quick question? Is there a distinction here between support for Palestinians, support for Hamas? Do any of these groups like in Kuwait and Bahrain make that distinction or is it just kind of vague enough to to serve both it's and either? not so vague because they're supporting the actions of the Palestinians. So okay. they're kind Thank of you. supporting Hamas. But I, I think that is true. We'll kind of see how that opens up. But uh, it is pretty strongly in support of the actions. So, yeah. Um, there's another, uh, trend that I noticed in the last iteration was this rise of, a, a, especially among younger, um, activists of this discourse that shared very much with a discourse in the West of leftist activists. Um, in the last conflict, it often took this language of sort of racism, um, uh, because of the Sheikh Jarrah situation and the, and the, um, uh, fact of Palestinians being, uh, uh, kind of, you know, kicked out of their homes. 
Um, but the current one is very much centered, and I'm sure any of you have been on social media are seeing this on a, on anti-colonial uh, language, decolonization kind of language that definitely throws kind of Israel and the United States in the same boat together as the villains in this scenario. Um, and it's kind of uh, striking and the again, not really condemning a lot what the Palestinians are doing. I wouldn't say like maybe even in some cases justifying it in this kind of decolonization uh, language. Um, and I'll say that that's one other thing I just want to note in this. It's a side thing, but I think it's interesting that there are other regional players that are very much trying to link into that language, uh, notably Russia, um, where you can see uh, Russia out there very much also kind of condemning the U.S. Uh, in these same sorts of terms um, and even um, explicitly saying, and you can see this in Russian intellectuals, and I mentioned this because they're also being circulating on Arab social media um, and explicitly saying in this new terminology that gets into this new multipolar um, world that Russia is sort of one pole, the Muslim world is another pole that both have, um, that are battling kind of a deviant West that's trying to um, negate sort of these other poles and reimpose kind of a unipolar order. So I think that's sort of interesting because that discourse is, is out there underlying some of the current actions um, and something to watch. So let me get to, sorry, I'm probably going a little bit long, but let me get specifically to the question of today about um, whether this will uh lead so far it doesn't sound like hugely different from what we've seen before in the language except for these couple of things i've noted um i think it's important to look to maybe saudi uh media to understand this question of normalization because saudi of course is the key player here on whether the abraham accords could like move forward and expand or not and it's very interesting because if you look at saudi media just prior to the hamas actions um, there was a real campaign, I would say, of op-eds in the Saudi and Arab media by Saudi opinion writers sort of championing normalization. Um, and we could see this. I'm going to I'm going to stick to one writer, Abdul Rahman al-Rashid, who is um, uh, formerly the editor of Ashraq al-Ausat and writing in Ashraq al-Ausat. Um, because he's very clear in what he's saying. And in this, I think I just want to note two things uh, in his writing. One is um, basically a criticism of prior peace efforts, um, stating sort of the advantages of moving towards a bilateral um, movement towards peace, um, seeing those as being more successful. And I think that's interesting because it implicitly is sort of criticizing the Arab Peace Initiative um, and also backing away from the commitment of Palestinian state in favor of just support for negotiations or just bringing the Palestinians back into a position where they can negotiate with Israel instead of explicitly saying that they're holding for Palestinian state. And these were two very significant moves. And this came right after we saw um, Mohammed bin Salman speaking on Fox News, of course, and kind of giving some of these similar uh, arguments. So I think that was where the... Um, Saudi social space was, uh, formal social space was, and the media is controlled by the state uh, prior to this. I think it's interesting now if we look that the Saudis are, uh, Abdul Rahman Rashid has put out another op-ed, um, which is titled 16 Years Later, Israel is Paying the Price for the 2007 Gaza Conflict, which basically really criticizes Israel and its position of isolating Gaza from the rest of the Palestinian national movement and that laying the seed sort of for the current problem and arguing very much that uh, they need to take a hard look at their policies, um, what they have not been giving to the Palestinians and look at re-empowering some kind of authority, a legitimate Palestinian government that could uh, kind of speak for the overall arena. Um, so I think we can kind of see with that um, how, um, and I should say there's some other things in the Saudi media too that still kind of play out and, and talk about uh, the Palestinians being linked to Iran. So I think there are still um, 
elements within the Saudi discourse that will allow them, depending on how the situation goes, to come back in line with the normalization, but clearly with a stronger sort of position towards the Palestinians is what I would say right now. First of all, while we're on this topic, let me take a question from the audience. And the question is really, in the Abraham Accord states or Saudi Arabia, um, do you see or could this spark some quiet pushback on the government to disengage from a normalization process or pull back? Have you seen that in what what you've been talking about? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the bigger pressure would be on Bahrain, um, not on the UAE. I mean, we can see a little bit harsher language in the UAE and some sort of opinion, opinionated people, <laughs> I guess I would say on social media. Um, in line, I think, uh, with sort of this shocking sort of Palestinian outbreak, um, uh, direct action by the Palestinians. But um, I think... My judgment is just that uh, I don't I think that they have quite a bit of control over the ability of people to voice these concerns, Um, but it will depend very much on where I think things go, as Hussein said, into the future. I think Bahrain could have a, a bit more difficult position, but again, in the same uh, way, these are not things that we haven't seen before. I mean, this division already exists. They're already by far the pal- the Bahraini population is strongly against the normalization that has taken place and they've been able to go forward. I would say definitely it, it makes it much more difficult for these kind of person to person coordination. But I think we're kind of in uncharted territory because we don't know how things are going to go once we see what we know is going to, well, looks like is going to happen with a really major um, Israeli intervention in Gaza and how that might spread. Um, Just one other mention of that, too, and it's the last thing I'll say, is, um, you know, the presence of of Hamas uh, um, and especially the Ezzedine al-Qasim Brigade, which is, of course, the one who uh, is responsible for undertaking this. We do see some presence and following of uh, the spokesperson for that brigade, again, you know, with a very masked face and this kind of thing, the more militant language. Um, and I think it's I've seen this even circulating within um, the Gulf state uh, media or social media. And I, but it's very hard to see on social media what kind of support that's garnering because that's really not so much allowed in many of these states. But I think it's something to to think about, especially because um, Hamas is called explicitly through all of their officials and this includes the officials abroad for this Friday to have uh, everybody sort of participate. And this gets to the point that Hussein said about wanting to spread and expand the conflict. So they're explicitly calling for Palestinians in the West Bank to confront Israeli forces. They're calling for 48 Palestinians inside of Israel to come down and to protect Al-Aqsa, again, putting the emphasis on Al-Aqsa, and for uh, refugee Palestinians to come to the borders of their states and for other supporters to come out and show their support. So I think even as early as this Friday, we'll get a sense of how much this is really resonating, what Hamas is doing. Um, But I think for a lot of this, we're probably gonna have to wait and see how things play out. Kristen, thank you. Um, Ali, I wanna come to you next. And I mean, Hussein, at the beginning of his remarks, uh, virtually every editorial and a lot of comment that we have seen assumes or asserts that Iran was directly involved in the planning or approval of the Hamas attacks, uh, or at least supporting Hamas. But both American and Israeli officials have stated publicly that they have seen no direct evidence of Iranian involvement in these particular attacks. So uh, with your knowledge of the Iranian government uh, and their pathways, their support for the militias that they call the axis of resistance, what's the story here? Um, Was Iran involved specifically? Is uh, Iran involved indirectly? And how do we actually know what Iran's role is? A lot of questions, so take it as you want. Thank you so much for the invitation and for providing me with this opportunity to share my analysis uh, video. Uh, The Islamic Republic officials have never, you know, hidden the fact that Iran financially supports 
uh, Hamas. This is nothing new. Uh, we also did hear Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei praising the uh, operations of, of Hamas against Israel. And it is not so difficult to uh, make a, you know, couple the two things, you know, the financing element and the fact that Iran is praising the attack. So in other words, this is the reason why the Islamic Republic provides Hamas with financial assistance. The question of Quds Force involvement and Quds Force's support to the Hamas uh, movement and training of Hamas operatives uh, may be somewhat more difficult uh, to prove, at least you know, when with, with our access to the to the open source material. But it is fully within the doctrine of the Quds Force, and it is also something that every once in a while is actually discussed in the military journals of the Revolutionary Guard, uh, sometimes to the surprise of those people here in the U.S. who perceive uh, the Islamic Republic as a sectarian player, only reaching out and aligning itself to Sunni movements. As a matter of fact, the Islamic Republic is very, very pragmatic, and every once in a while aligns with Sunnis against shared enemies. And in this case, this particular case, uh, what we also see is that nobody really is interested in the facts because it is not politically expedient. It is not politically expedient for the current administration in the United States with almost one year to the presidential election to admit that Iran is a moment because if the U.S. admits and uh, finds evidence to the Islamic Republic involvement, the United States is expected to act against Iran. And since the, the United States is not interested in entangling itself in another forever war before the presidential election, the U.S. government cannot find the evidence. The same goes for the government of Israel. The government of Israel, I assume, prefers the United States to fight Israel, Israel's wars with, with, with Iran rather than itself fighting against Iran. So Israel, too, cannot find evidence of Iranian involvement in Hamas's operation. To the motives, I completely agree with my colleague, Dr. Hossein Ibish. Uh, I, too, believe that shared interests and shared objectives brought the Quds Force and Hamas together. Uh, Hamas fears uh, Saudi-Israeli rapprochement and establishment of normal diplomatic relations, so does Iran. And what we have seen is that those talks and negotiations between Saudi Arabia and Israel have been postponed. This is a clear win from Iran's point of view. Hamas is probably interested in shattering the myth of Israel as an impenetrable fortress which can protect itself and, and, and hide behind the Iron Dome and walls at the border. Now, so does Iran, because Iran has unfinished business with Israel. Iran has a nuclear program, uh, which may be bombed at some point by Israel. And the small operation of Hamas shows that the Iron Dome can be penetrated. Now, this is a very, very important thing from Iran's point of view, because if Israel's Iron Dome cannot protect Israeli citizens against Hamas, how can it protect Israeli citizens against the combined missile arsenals of Hezbollah, Iran, Hamas, and perhaps even some Iranian allied uh, uh, militant groups in Iraq and in Syria. All of these factors complicate Israel's calculations when it comes to bombarding Iran's nuclear facilities. And of course, the Quds Force and the Islamic Republic also have unfinished business with Israel because Mossad has managed to humiliate Iran's military and security establishment. For more than 10 years, we have seen Mossad assassination of Iran, Iranian nuclear scientists. We have seen assassination of one Quds Force officer and interrogation of another Quds Force officer on Iranian soil. The interrogation was videotaped. The videotaped interrogation was broadcasted on Iranian, Iran international television, which is based in London and uh, reportedly uh, 
financed by, by the government of Saudi Arabia. This was a total humiliation for Iran. It was also more than a humiliation. It was almost an encouragement to the Iranian opposition and to the people of Iran who dislike the Islamic government. If the government is as incompetent as these events show, why don't you try to overthrow it? And these things, uh, they uh, necessitated a response from Iran. And, and this is why I believe that the Islamic Republic, the Ghost Force, and Hamas had a shared goal of achieving specific objectives, which led to the tragic events that we saw on Israeli territory. And unfortunately, we will be witnessing in the Palestinian areas. Uh, most unfortunately, the Islamic Republic has once again managed to use Palestinians as expendable pawns in its grand chess game against Israel. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, Hussein, I want to come back to you for yeah. a moment because I mean, Kristen talked a lot about um, what will happen next depending upon what happens next and how right. um, Israel's planned assault on Gaza will go. We've got a couple of questions uh, from the audience I want to draw in. Uh, it seems clear that the United States is pressing Israel to allow some sort of humanitarian civilian corridor to pot potentially get people out of Gaza. Um, how do you think Israel is going to manage an assault on Gaza with the huge civilian presence? And how do you think that Egypt will react? Will Egypt open the Rafah crossing or other crossings? No. And, and no. what is likely to happen? So you, okay. I'll, I'll let you uh, all right. take those two all right. questions. So first of all, let me just throw in, apropos of, of Ali's excellent comments, that what we've gotten the broad line from the administration was sort of summed up by the Deputy National Security Advisor, John Finer, who said Iran is broadly complicit. Right? That's the line, is broadly complicit. So that's that's perfectly poised between an accusation and a uh, dunno kind of statement. It avoids the red line of the Biden um uh, sort of, I mean, he really didn't make a red line, but he did say that if Iran killed Americans, the United States would strike Iran. So now you've got people on the American right <clears throat> saying, hey, you have to act on that. And uh, it's a stretch in both directions. But uh, let me answer your question, <laughs> which is, uh, look, I, I don't know what Israel is going to do. They have a new line today which is that Hamas cannot continue. I mean, the initial stuff coming out was Imas Delenda Est, Hamas must be destroyed, that's it, no more Hamas, eliminated. Now, you know, in the cold light of day, they realize you cannot destroy an organization with force. Right? Anyone can call themselves Hamas, I mean, it's just not possible. So in addition to that, I think there's really the question of, are they being drawn into a trap? So the new line, coming out of uh, Tel Aviv is that Hamas cannot continue as a sovereign entity on the border with Israel. That's that's the position they're taking. So they want to kill as many Hamas leaders and cadres as they can. And uh, I think in many cases, they say their families, they just throw that in, and uh, which is totally immoral, but they say it. And they want to reestablish deterrence through the usual uh, IDF and even pre-state Haganah idea of disproportionality, that they would always ensure that a vastly larger number of Palestinian civilians are killed than, than Israeli ones in, in any phase of this conflict. And they have never failed to do that. So I'm sure they want to do that again. And that they damage and de destroy as much uh, material and equipment as they can to degrade Hamas ability insofar as possible. The conundrum becomes, how do you manage doing that? How do you manage eliminating Hamas as a sovereign and quasi-sovereign on Israel's border? So the only real way to do that is not through force imposed by the outside. It's by reoccupying the streets of the population centers of Gaza, Gaza City, Khan Yunus, and all the other towns in, in the Strip. That's the only way you could do it. And that then creates exactly what I think Hamas is looking for, which is a constant stream of uh, killed and captured Israeli soldiers, 
um, being conducted by a an already planned and established insurgency. And this is ready. They're ready for them. I have zero doubt they're ready for them. I'm sure that they were shocked at how little um, defenses they encountered and how little resistance they encountered from Israel in the incursion. In other words, I think it succeeded uh, wildly beyond the expectations of its planners. But they certainly were expecting a counteroffensive, and they're hoping for one. So it's, uh, come on in. So the Israelis are aware of this. So now they have this conundrum. Like, how can they achieve their aim? but not get caught in the trap. I don't think they know. Secondly, the question is, if Hamas is not going to be ruling in Gaza, who will? Will it be Israel directly? That gets you back into this constant abattoir for Israeli conscripts, right? Every every week, every day, somebody gets picked off. Uh, they don't want that. The Palestinian Authority and Fatah are not going to come in to Gaza on the back of Israeli tanks. They resisted coming back into the crossings of Gaza and other key places of Gaza when Egypt tried to arrange it several times in the past decade. They didn't even want to come back into Nablus, which they've sort of lost control over. They're very cautious. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas has become a hyper-cautious leader rather than a national leader, and, and he won't want any part of it. Um, I don't know that there's any alternative that's a rational one for Israel other than doing whatever they can and then withdrawing from the Gaza Strip and allowing the return of some version of the status quo ante with Hamas greatly degraded. It restrained themselves to that. And the conflict does not spread into the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Lebanon, and Golan then I think the Israelis will minimize the harm that this does to them and that they will be able to get back into uh, discussions with Saudi Arabia about normalization and they will avoid the great trap that has been set for them. But I don't see how they can achieve their stated aims without without falling into that trap. And this is the conundrum. I don't have an answer and I don't think they have a clue about what to do. Uh, Kristen, I, I want to ask a couple of questions from the audience. The first one from um, AJCW's Executive Vice President, uh, Ambassador Bill Roebuck. Um, in your opinion, what factor will be more important in prompting support from Palestinians outside Gaza and others in the Arab world to the current crisis? Is it mounting Palestinian casualties and the, the scenes you've seen of the results of the bombing in Gaza? Is it... Uh, Jerusalem under siege and the imagery that you've seen, or is it something else, including um, even continued criticisms of the uh, sort of before the national unity government in Israel, the very uh, right wing government that uh, was in place when this attack took took, uh, took effect or some other reason? What, what do you think are the most powerful arguments that might expand support for Hamas for these attacks and get more Palestinians and other Arabs engaged? Um. I think my instincts tell me, and this is based on sort of prior um, conflicts, so I could be wrong because I think we do have some new dynamics here. But um, previously, let's say, when we've seen uh, bombing sort of of um, Gaza, um, the Arab states have been able to weather that and sort of start to blame Hamas for that um, because effectively they're saying, this is what this brings you. Um, and I think for Hamas, then their goal is to spread this, um, conflict back to the West Bank, um, and hopefully even further. <laughs> so I think that's sort of what we're going to see. And we can see that in the initial Hamas statements is kind of calling for people to go to Al-Aqsa to bring these more resonant things, um, and into the West Bank, um, to sort of spread the conflict, so I think that's going to be sort of the um, the separate challenges. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to see how the Gulf states might position themselves. And this is where Saudi Arabia might be in a better position than a UAE, which has already signed accords and is sort of uh, more committed in that their direction. Um, we've seen Saudi Arabia reach out and speak to um, Iran <laughs> just yesterday. 
um, they're kind of all speaking around to everyone, I think, um, as well. And this was the first time I think that that uh, MBS has spoken to Orai EC, if I'm right on that. So that is interesting. Um, so I think uh, they have a little bit more flexibility in, in how they position themselves um, when this gets into a more difficult situation uh, in Gaza as they can try to represent themselves as sort of uh, negotiators for, well, not negotiators, but kind of a spokesperson for de-escalation. So I think it kind of depends on how things play out. Yeah. And, and Ali, let me pick up on one of Kristen's point. The, the telephone conversation between Mohammed bin Salman and President Raisi yesterday, um, what is the Iranian calculus now? Do they want to continue to manage their improving or previously improving relations with the Gulf, particularly Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, or have they decided that this is no longer a goal and that this they're going to focus um, on uh, Israel and Palestinians? Again, is this is this Khani's plan after the killing of Soleimani? Is this a broader Iranian strategy? And uh, what do you anticipate their their strategy will be going forward with the Gulf countries, particularly those that have been talking to Israel? Uh, for Iran, uh, normalization of diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia was, was a huge victory because the United States under the Trump administration had tried to isolate Iran diplomatically. And finally, Iran managed to break out of isolation, you know, first by normalizing diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates and next with Saudi Arabia. So it is a huge victory for them. And it would be a terrible waste if Iran walks away. This is not my impression that uh, um, it is a, such an agenda that Iran is pursuing. The Islamic Republic wants to maintain uh, uh, those relations with Saudi Arabia, but those relations are very difficult uh, to maintain uh, because of other reasons. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the you know Iran International Television is still broadcasting programs uh, which are highly critical of the Islamic Republic. This is an issue, still an issue between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. On the other hand, uh, uh, Iranian media, uh, uh, particularly those belonging to uh, some uh, Shia extremist groups, they are still producing anti-Saudi materials. So there is a tit for tat, you know, element between Saudi-supported media and and uh, Islamic Republic-supported media. Uh, so the media warfare, you know, that remains an issue. Uh, and 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 obviously, if if Saudi Arabia uh, um, perceives uh, Iran's actions and you know, with regards to to Hamas and and the attack against Israel as an indirect attack against Saudi and Saudi interests and designs for the future, then it is also you know another. Uh, complicating uh, uh, factor uh, but but you know again you know from Iran's perspective it is important you know to to continue the path of uh, a good neighborly relations you know with Saudi Arabia for as long as possible uh, Hussein let me come back to you and talk a little bit about um potential efforts at I will say not de-escalation but preventing significant escalation in the current situation um First question is, who is likely to be focusing mostly on not expanding the conflict in the future? And we have two questions, one from Nizar Hilal at the Gulf Studies yeah. Center at Qatar University, and another one from uh, former American ambassador to Kuwait, Larry Silverman, about the role of China in the region. Um, can yeah. China take on this role? What is the future of Chinese mediation like uh, took place between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the restoration of relations. So a, a complex question there. Uh, okay, L let me let me uh, deal with the, the Chinese issue first. I mean, I, I don't think China is positioned to play a role here at all. And um, I think that if anything, this exposes how marginal China is in the Middle East, in the Gulf, between Israel and Arab countries with regard to the Palestinian question. It's not a factor. It has no ability to guarantee anything. It's not a major supporter of any of the parties involved. Um, it, even its relations with Iran are kind of, you know, marginal. And uh, yeah, it, it was in a position to broker a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran for the restoration of diplomatic relations, which is not that big a deal. It's, it goes back to sort of the 2015 era, and you know, that may be better or worse. And this happens all the time uh, for the last 100 years between Iran and Saudi Arabia. All right, so, so they brokered that. A lot of the heavy lifting was done in Iraq, by Iraq and in Iraq, where they swooped in at the last minute. The United States couldn't do it because it wasn't 
talk to Iran, won't talk to the United States. The United States doesn't talk to Iran directly, just couldn't. So somebody had to do it. So all parties had an interest in sort of doing it ceremonially in Beijing. But that doesn't really mean that Iran, that China has emerged as a significant diplomatic force in the region. It really has not. And when the stuff hits the fan, like now, China is a very marginal actor, especially in, in the Levant and uh, in Israel-Palestine, with regard to Lebanon, et cetera. No. So what about stopping the conflict from spreading? For one thing, I think the United States deployment of a major aircraft carrier in the eastern Mediterranean is a clear warning to Hezbollah. It's not aimed at Hamas. It's not aimed at any lion's den group. It's aimed at Hezbollah. And it's just a statement that he, we are here. And if we get dragged into something and you help to drag us into something by putting Israel in a position where it, it feels compelled to attack Iran or something like that, or we find your behavior just intolerable, we're here. So know that. Uh, that kind of stick is being brandished. Joe Biden said, you know, anyone who's thinking of getting involved, just I have one word, don't. Don't. It was a very, you know, it was not Trumpian bluster, but it was a very clear threat, right? Uh, on the other hand, you have carrots going on. You have them working the phones clearly with different brokers, with Qatar, with Turkey, with those Egypt, with those who can communicate with uh, with Hamas, with Hezbollah. Uh, they are talking directly with the Palestinian Authority. They met with the PA leader, with Mahmoud Abbas directly. Um, Blinken is going to the region, to the Secretary of State, to talk to everybody, basically. Um, and I think there is a desire to communicate what would happen if people behave irrationally and get involved when it's not in their interest. The big question, I, it, it, the big question is, what does what does Iran do? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't think the U.S. is in much of a position to influence that because I think it's already the case that Iran and the United States definitely want to avoid a conflict with each other. And they've both made that very clear. And I think Ali is absolutely right that, that the reason for not pointing the blame directly at the Quds Force and Iran, and say we have evidence and all of that by the United States and even by Israel, is to avoid kicking in responses that are politically and possibly even legally or what have you um, mandated in some way that are irrational and unwise choices. So to retain your options, you say, well, they're broadly complicit because they've had so much support in recent years or historically or however you want to put it. But we don't have direct evidence. That's highly convenient. Um, and that's where things stand. Uh, Kristen, I, I want to ask you two sort of different questions in the list from, from Justin Alexander. The first one is with regard to um, how Qatar may manage their complicated relationship with Hamas, including hosting uh, a big chunk of the political bureau. Um, and uh, how the United States can work with Qatar to uh, try and de-escalate this. Um, second one, do you think the Gulf is going to be willing to pay for the reconstruction of, of Gaza when this is over, or will they be um, uh, essentially afraid that their investment, if they do this, will be destroyed again in a few years? So two totally different questions. Yeah. Um, first on the Qatar situation, I mean, they're in kind of a uniquely... I guess, in a way, difficult position, um, given that they still have this kind of privileged relationship with uh, Hamas leadership outside. Um, I will say that there's some question about sort of the Hamas leadership inside and outside and sort of divisions between them, but we will we'll table that for now, um, at least in the initial things. Uh, but um, I think when we look at that, uh, uh, it's clear what Qatar is trying to do is to be uh, use that as an asset at this moment, um, that they can use their communications and their privileged position with Hamas to help to release hostages. Um, so it's pretty clear that that's part of the negotiations that are going on with um, uh, Qatar trying to see if they can get uh, some of the hostages released. Um, uh, I think Israel is very much sort of uh, denying this or pushing against that right now, but they also have an interest in getting people out. 
Uh, so that's where Qatar is trying to position themselves so that their relationship is sort of a privileged one that can be helpful uh, in some ways. Um, but I think we already see uh, very much, uh, even in the U U.S. media space and stuff, a lot of this condemnation of Qatar and the fact that they're still housing members of Hamas is going to be very problematic for them down the road. So right now, I think they're trying to position themselves so that that's an asset. Um that they can help uh, use it in some ways, but that could be a big, big point for them down the road. Um, sorry, did I miss the second part of your question? Well, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the question was essentially, do you think that the Gulf states will be willing to finance the reconstruction of Gaza ah. once this is all over? and Or will they see this as, a, as an investment that is not going to last for long if they do it? Um, yeah, that's kind of hard to say for now. I think right now the game is sort of like uh, uh, to try to contain, I mean, for the, a lot of the Gulf states to contain it within, um, uh, within, I guess I would say, Gaza. Uh, whereas you can see the language by Hamas is to try to persuade it out and to get back into the West Bank and maybe to the other um, you know, 48 Palestinians and also to the broader Arab and Islamic world. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the game sort of right now. So I think uh, it's very possible that if it's kind of contained, that there will again be people willing to come in and, and help to, you know, kind of help with the reconstruction. But again, that sort of depends on the ultimate outcome, and we don't know where things are going to go in terms of Israeli sort of destruction of uh, Hamas or, or you know how they're going to be able to to intervene there. So there's a lot of unknowables, I think. Can I Thank add you. something um, to that? The, please the, saying, go ahead. Pressures, yeah. So one of the pressures on Hamas that produced this pushback is the fact that um, that they were feeling that they were losing the support of Turkey and Qatar to some extent. Turkey expelled a few Hamas leaders who were in Ankara, um, who were being particularly obnoxious. And Qatar continued to pay the public payroll salaries in Gaza, keep the economy afloat, keep people eating. But, which, which was with the uh, approval of the United States and Israel and the PA and everybody. But, uh, Qatar was making it very clear in recent months, even over a year, for about the last year, a little less, to Hamas, that this is not sustainable, that they can't just expect Doha to write a check every month to them, that they have to do something to generate more income, that they had to do something to create a more viable economy. Uh, and I think that was, that perceived loss of political support from Turkey. I mean, it's not a total loss, it's just an erosion. And a kind of complaining from Qatar about, look, this is just, you know, a blank check. I mean, it's open-ended, um, you know, sort of like a failure to launch kind of thing, um, I think was part of the, of the problem. And all of this, of course, drives Hamas closer and closer into cooperation with Iran, Hezbollah, and uh, other parties. And uh, I think Kristen's right. I think when the dust settles and the hostage issue is resolved as much as possible and Qatar has done what he can, they may find themselves under a lot of pressure to, I mean, look, Ismail Haniyeh is the titular head of Hamas. He's the head of the political bureau. He's the political leader. He's in Doha. He's issuing these statements that basically deny that Hamas killed any civilians and all kinds of other bizarre statements that he's been making. And he's doing it in Qatar. That may be an issue for them in the long run, right? Turkey is better positioned to, to say no, but they've also gone further than Qatar has in kind of distancing themselves from Hamas. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, Ali, I want to go back to Iran for just a minute, and I want to look at really the big picture of longer-term Iranian revolutionary religious uh, security goals in the region. So um, presumably Iran believes that its support for groups such as Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, the Hashid al-Shabi, the Houthis, is in its uh, short-term tactical interest. How do they see that these uh, that these groups play into their longer-term strategic interest? Is it, and is the goal of 
eliminating Israel really an Iranian goal at its heart, or is it an excuse that permits it to expand its power and to keep its regional uh, competitors uh, a bit off balance using that rhetoric and that support? Uh, supporting non-state uh, groups outside of Iran is a tradition going back to the Pahlavi era. You know, even the Shah's regime did the same thing. We tend to forget this, but it is a part of Iran's defense doctrine. Uh, during the Shah, from 1960 to 1975, Iran was supporting the uh, struggle and the fight of uh, Kurdish Iraqis against the central government in Baghdad. And that was because Iran had problems with the central government in Baghdad. So uh, Iran's uh, officers, you know, from the Secret Service Sabak, in cooperation, by the way, and most interestingly, with officers from the Israeli Mossad, were helping Iraqi Kurds to undermine the central government in Baghdad. They were blowing up oil pipelines. They were attacking border stations. They were attacking Iraqi central government forces in Iraqi Kurdistan mountains. So this is a tradition going back to the early 1960s. This is nothing new. And I suspect this uh, will continue for a very, very long time in the future. Because well, it's, I, I, it's, I, let, let me ask the question, though. Is, are these short term tactical steps that a succession, a succession of Iranian governments have made, or is this an overall strategic uh, plan to uh, expand Iranian power and influence in the region, right? or so, something in between? I, I suspect both the Pahlavi regime and the Islamic Republic have written military doctrines that we have not seen and we do not have access to. However, within the state, there are also bureaucracies and organizations pushing for this agenda. In other words, even if the regime changes or even when there is a change of government in Iran, let's say that a reformist president like Mr. Khatami goes out and Mr. Ahmadinejad comes in, regardless who is president, those same bureaucracies and government organizations are pushing for the same agenda. And that is to provide support to these proxy organizations working outside of Iran. Now, the proxies, most of the time, are not a goal. They do not constitute a goal in themselves. They're helping Iran to achieve a bigger role. On the defensive side, the idea is that if Iran's enemies are busy fighting these proxy groups close to their borders, the enemy will not be knocking on the doors of Iran, the Iranian homeland. Now, that you know, thinking is not always correct, but that is a part of the uh, fundamental idea behind supporting those proxy groups. And the other uh, issue, which is extremely important for Iran uh, and, and, and the survival of the Iranian state as they see it, is Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Perhaps the Islamic Republic has not reached the conclusion that it actually wants the bomb immediately. And perhaps they would like to do the same thing as the Shah's regime, which is bringing Iran and Iran's nuclear program to a state when it is not just even a nuclear threshold state, but a state which within a very, very short period of time is capable of producing the bomb. And these things, you know, having a proxy, so many proxies, by the way, close you know, to the Israeli border, practically surrounding Israel uh, and arming them with missiles, this provides a credible deterrence for Iran as they see it. This is also why that I do not believe that Iran, for the time being, is the least interested in involving Lebanese Hezbollah in, 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 in the Gaza war. They're not the least interested. Because Hezbollah is such a huge asset and such an important deterrent against Israel bombing and attacking, targeting Iran's nuclear facilities. Back in 2006, we have extremely credible reports from within Iran that Mr. Qasem Soleimani was extremely angry uh, with Sheikh Hassan Nasr. Allah, Hezbollah leader, who initiated the war against Israel by taking and uh, kidnapping Israeli uh, border guards. That was a disaster from Iran's point of view, because this is not the purpose that Iran has in mind for Lebanese Hezbollah. Lebanese Hezbollah should never start an attack. It should be a deterrent force. Yeah, so let me just say that that, that all makes total sense, except for this. Um if this goes very badly for Israel, as I said before, 
they may really feel that, like you said, surrounded by Iranian proxies, Palestinian hornets, a Lebanese cobra. And um, that certainly, in one hand, creates a deterrent, as you said. It's also a provocation. It's a provocation because it provides, under certain circumstances, potentially the incentive for Israel to take the war to the sponsors of these uh, proxies. And that I just wanted to throw that in. That's, it's definitely possible. But what they have achieved, at least in the short term, I mean, is that we had pushed pretty far along in the Biden administration conversation with the Saudis. And I think that's the key kind of turning point um, to, you know, have some sort of agreement. Right. Um, right. And I think that's sort of that's definitely off the table um, for the moment. I think the Saudis, if you see, they're still willing to think about this in very strategic sort of national um, nationalist sort of interest, but the current context will make that um, sort of impossible for them to move forward in the in the short term. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, again, what happens depends how difficult it is. If it's contained in Gaza, and Israel is limited in how vicious it is, and you know, then then it's possibly manageable, but maybe not. Well, it depends. A lot depends on how it's perceived. Perceived, right? It, a lot depends on on how much blame gets assigned to Hamas for Israel's very predictable, almost inevitable, disproportionate response towards Palestinian civilians, and whatever else happens. Uh, you asked me also. I did. I didn't answer your question on Egypt, Doug. So Egypt will not open the Rafah crossing. Egypt has striven for years. It has been one of Egypt's main foreign policy goals not to get sucked back into Gaza ever again. And it has been one of its main domestic policy goals not to accept the two million Palestinians from Gaza to come into uh, into Egypt. They don't want to bail Israel out. They don't want extra burden of two million people. They don't think they created this problem, and they're right. And they don't think they should have to solve this problem. So even in such a dire situation, they will not be opening Rafa to floods. To some people, yes, they already are opening it for people with uh, with permissions. But just simply throwing open the border uh, and creating a humanitarian corridor for hundreds of thousands, perhaps one and a half million people from from Gaza, no, they're not going to do it. They categorically will not do it. Um. In the last 15, 20 minutes we have, I want to really look to the future and what might happen beyond uh, the next couple of weeks. And I want to start with an early question we got from Chase Winter, essentially saying that there are two concurrent narratives now. One is that because of the Hamas attacks and the Israeli response, Arab-Israeli normalization is off the cards. But the other one, the other half of that is that perhaps with a renewed threat from militants, particularly Iran-supported militants, Arab states in the Gulf might see a real reason to expand security cooperation with the United States. Um, maybe, Hussein, I'll start with you. What, what yeah, do you think me, of these two narratives and where might they end up? I think they're both plausible. And let me throw one thing out. I mean, we I can't really answer which is... It, it, as we all keep saying, it, it depends what happens. Right? So calculations cannot be made now. The reason everything is on hold between Israel and Saudi Arabia and the uh, United States and Saudi Arabia is that nobody can calculate because we do not know what political landscape we are operating in. The equation is changing so quickly, and there are so many imponderables uh, at, at work that uh, calculations cannot be made. Uh, under under these circumstances, except war calculations. And thank goodness these countries are not involved in any war. And so they're just going to hold back and see. However, both of those scenarios are plausible, right? I'll throw out a third one, um, specifically uh, regarding Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi decision-making is highly personalized. And uh, it centers around King Salman as the final arbiter, but uh, the head of government is the prime minister, that is uh, the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Okay, the head of government in Saudi Arabia may also be feeling very strongly that this is an attack on his independent diplomatic 
uh, his di- diplomatic independence of decision making. That, in other words, Palestinians in league with Iran and Hezbollah, uh, some Palestinians are acting to forestall a diplomatic move that he was trying to put together for his country and to and also to rehabilitate himself in Washington. Right. And he may feel personally very angry with Hamas over this. I think there's a good chance of that. He's not the most patient guy in the world, apparently. And uh, even I think I would be you know, really miffed if I were on the other side of this. Like, why are you deliberately wrecking up my potential agenda? Under such circumstances, that could also be a factor. In other words, if it's contained in Gaza, if it's manageable politically, you might find a kind of buzz attitude on the part of uh, Riyadh towards um, everyone who doesn't want it to go forward with Israel and the United States. And if they can make a reasonable deal, they're not, they may be defiantly uh, motivated to reject the idea that Hamas has a veto or Palestinians have a veto, or anybody has a veto over what Saudi Arabia uh, does, if it, if it can get a you know a, um, a significant Palestinian component, it's not even going to give the PA the ability. They took 14 points to Riyadh, right? And it went straight into the round file. It, it, was, it was, they lit a cigarette in it or something. And they're not interested. They want to consult and coordinate. They want to make sure that it's minimally okay with the Palestinians, at least that they're not going to go out and demonstrate in the streets against it, the PLO, I don't know. But um, beyond that, I don't think they're interested in giving people a veto on the grounds that they've gone and murdered 1,300 people. That's, you know, so that's a third factor, Chase. Just to add to that point, I mean, I think it's, Interesting. The Saudis are playing a very complex game. I think we need to recognize. I mean, they do have this agreement to de-escalate with um, Iran that's like overseen by China. And I think they're serious about that. They really want to keep that. I mean, Saudi's main interest right now is in a quiet region where they can go forward with their Vision 2030 project, with their global reintegration and with their tourism and everything. I mean, that needs a quiet region, right? So I think they're playing a very complicated game where they're trying to quiet things with Iran and make the deal as well with Israel, with the U.S., ultimately for their security. That involves um, also um, uh, normalizing to some degree ties with Israel. I think Iran in a way has, well, if we if we say that Iran is the proxy in this, and I, I don't want to overemphasize that because Hamas does have its own uh, interests. But at least the way things have gone so far, they've stopped, managed to stop, at least in the short term, the Saudi attempt to kind of balance between these two positions between Iran and Israel to keep those both ties open. Um, So it'll be interesting to see sort of how that that plays out and what the Saudis try to do with that, because they don't have an interest. I don't think they have an interest in ending sort of the de-escalation with Iran. But right now, Iran has, if we see it, at least the impact of what has happened so far is that they've managed to stop the normalization ties with Israel, where they were trying to have both kind of arms uh, present, if that makes sense. And I must I must say that I am uh, concerned uh, about uh, Iran, Iran and Iranian overconfidence, because the Islamic Republic has been fairly successful in a number of cases. Uh, the Islamic Republic said that they wanted to keep the Bashar al-Assad regime in power in Syria. All Arab countries, Turkey and the United States, said the opposite, and Iran won. Uh, The Islamic Republic managed to deny military victory to Saudi Arabia and UAE in Yemen. They achieved this objective. They managed to attack shipping, international shipping, and they attacked uh, the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia, uh, unpunished, and they were actually rewarded for this by normalizing normalizing relations with UAE and with Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. They managed to survive the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign, which was an economic warfare against the Islamic Republic with the uh, unexpressed goal of regime change. President Trump, after all, said that his objective was to bring down Iran's oil exports to zero. 
and was fairly successful in this regard. But nevertheless, the regime survived. And now uh, the Islamic Republic can celebrate uh, the uh, uh, terrorist incursion of Hamas into Israeli territory uh, and, and the catastrophes that uh, will uh, you know, befall uh, everyone, including you know, the, the Israeli uh, uh, military in, 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 in a possibly uh, Israeli occupied uh, Gaza. So these victories uh, uh, make you try to repeat your successes uh, and also opens the path of some degree of adventures. So this is what I'm concerned about, Iranian overconfidence. Well, I mean, it's definitely a factor. And um, there, we just saw hubris is a big factor in, in conflicts. We just saw Israeli hubris at, at its worst. Um, Hussein, let, let me ask you a question, because uh, <clears throat> I, I want to look also at the future of <clears throat> Gulf relations with the Levant. Um, I, I want to end with, with Palestinians, but I want to start with uh Jordan and Syria, two countries we haven't talked much about this morning. Uh, there has been a sort of an inevitable move toward trying to pull Bashar al-Assad back into the Arab camp, uh, yep. partially successful. Um, will this change the attitude of the Gulf toward, uh, toward Assad? There have been some very difficult moments in uh, sort of Saudi Jordanian relations, at least um, in recent times. Um, and maybe finally, um, I will throw Iraq in here as well. Uh, what what does the it's Gulf simple. see yeah. as Iraq, uh, as their goals for Iraq going forward, assuming that they now see Iraq mostly lost again to, to the yeah. Iranians? Uh, yeah. you, to take right. any or all of that you, that you'd like. Yeah, and, and you can throw Lebanon in as well. So it just let's separate the two, right? So Jordan is not connected to Iran in in from the point of view of Gulf countries. So um I think after a lot of Saudi uh, Jordanian tension that was very personalized and familial and you know petty and whatnot, um, they're back on track. They they managed to put it behind them to some extent. There may be some personal feelings, but you know it's the, the, the national. Um, there's been a rapprochement at the national level. That's really important because Jordan. Everyone needs Jordan to do what Jordan does, as I always say. And then you ask me, what does Jordan do? We need a webinar. That's not that's not an easy answer, but it basically is a hinge that keeps the status quo viable in all kinds of different ways. It sits at the center of the uh, mushrik and and it just uh, plays a very balancing role in all kinds of ways with the Palestinians, with intelligence, with Syria, with refugees, all kinds of ways. So uh, I think there is going to be an, an attempt, as always, to protect Jordan from Israel's overreaching, particularly if the violence spreads into uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. You may see Israeli hardliners if they remain in the government, uh, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, these other Jewish supremacists, and hyper-annexations, including the right wing of Likud, an absurd concept that it exists. Uh, you know, uh, calling for immediate annexations, and we can't protect our towns and villages in the West Bank, uh, you know, if this is what happens and da 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 da, you, you can get you write the script rights itself. It's very easy to say this, and we need just need to annex. We need to create new borders. We need to, you know, build giant walls all around us and what have you. And that, you know, this is a disaster, of course, for Jordan. So they want to protect Jordan from that, and they need to, you know, to some extent, project protect the Jordanian economy now. As for the countries uh, that are perceived as very close to Iran, the Lebanon because of Hezbollah, Syria, and Iraq, which is on again, off again, but yeah, it's now perceived as having drifted back, you know, too close to Iran. I think there's a, a real desire because of what Kristen was saying about the Saudi need, and uh, this applies to other countries as well, um, to the UAE, it applies to Qatar, you know, they, all these countries have an interest in maintaining the de-escalation for various reasons. For the Saudis, it's existential because they can't survive if they don't pull off, economically cannot survive, if they don't pull off this rapid transformation to a post hydrocarbon economy. Pretty simple as that. Everybody else has many more options than they do because of much smaller population and much smaller size. So because of that, Saudi Arabia has a real interest 
in maintaining dialogue with all these countries and trying to use what I've called maneuver. That is everything except conflict and confrontation, direct uh, military intervention on the ground or use of proxies who are armed in Syria and Iraq to try to use um, politics, investment, diplomacy, commerce, infrastructure to incentivize um, the uh, different forces inside Iraq and Syria to um, be more neutral, to not not cause them headaches, to be reasonable, whatever, uh, whatever you can get out of them. Lebanon is a more complicated question, uh, but always there is this process which is repeated in Iraq as well of engagement and then walking away in disgust because your Lebanese and or Iraqi allies can't and won't and just are not able to do what you want them to do <laughs> to assert them, themselves when they, they really don't have the ability to do it. And you walk away and then you realize walking away is a mistake. And you come back in. And this is just a repeated scenario. In Lebanon, it's been going on for 25 years. In Iraq, it's been going on for, well, maybe 10 years. So um, I think we can expect more of the same if the violence doesn't spread. If the violence spreads, then you have to see what kind of chaos you're in and, and operate accordingly. Professor Christian, I, I want to ask you to look a little bit into your crystal ball into the future. I'm going to pull together a couple of the questions that we have from the audience. And uh, try to ask you to think about what Gulf or other Arab attitudes toward Palestinians uh, might be or how it might evolve going forward. I mean, the, you've got the messages from Ismail Haniya and Khalid Michel calling for uh, sort of protests on Friday and support for Palestinians in general. Um, how do Gulf Arabs and how do does the broader Arab community see Hamas going forward, the PA, Lion's Den, um, average Palestinians, Palestinian Israelis. In other words, how are there, is the theoretical change in the script for Israeli-Palestinian relations that Hamas seeks to, to, uh, to put in place, is that going to change the way that Arabs, other Arabs perceive Palestinians? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, if you look at the UAE and then um, Israel's, I mean, uh, Saudi is a little bit more complicated, but basically we've had a process of trying to move from the sort of Arab solidarity, definitely Islamic solidarity, towards national interests. And you can see this very much in the way that these states talk about this. And the whole Abraham Accords are kind of built on this, right, that we're going to pursue our own national interests. We're not going to let the Palestinians anymore dictate what those national interests are, Um for Saudi, this is much more complicated, of course, because they do they hold sort of Mecca and Medina. Those are real uh, resources for them to have this sort of Islamic solidarity and the like. Um, but they've also been trying to disentangle themselves from the kind of hornet's nest of, of Palestinian, uh, you know, kind of nationalism that can dictate to them how they can do things. I think this breaking out of Hamas. Uh, into Israeli territories and is a, is kind of throwing a wrench in all of these plans. Because when you look at the nationalist kind of plans that we're all pursuing our national interests, it's all done uh, to some extent at the expense of the Palestinians, who of course don't really have their own nation state and are seeing their nation state being more and more absorbed. So you can understand then to some extent, not, I don't wanna uh, justify the violence or anything, but you can understand the, this breakout of Gaza, which is literally like penned in and trying to bring this to attention. So I think, um, you know, part of this is just going to be um, the Gulf states uh, to a large extent trying to put this contained and sort of put this back in its box and to keep this from spreading. Um, while at the same time, the Palestinians, or at least Hamas, has an interest in, in spreading this and in gaining more kind of support. Um, and I think it's it's difficult. I would say my sense is that the messaging coming from the Gulf states of kind of more national interests and stuff has been gaining ground uh, with the population. But we're at this in-between state, right? And if you start to see Palestinian lives so much on the line, massacred, you know, these are things that Hamas can play upon and can be more resonant. And especially, as Hussein always likes to say, if this moves to Jerusalem and to the West Bank as well, um, so that's going to be sort of the game of now, I think, is containment versus uh, expansion sort of of the conflict. And we'll just have to see um, 
how that plays out. Okay, we've got about uh, three or four minutes left. If I can ask each of you to just sum up uh, what you would like the audience to take from this going forward, whether it be U.S. policy, what uh, the key issues are going forward. Ali, let's uh, let's start with you. Unfortunately, we are yet again in one of those uh, moments where the great wheels of history begin moving and a lot of people are crushed under it. Uh, I uh, I just uh, pray for the best for the people. And uh, uh, we as, as, as researchers and scholars, uh, we try to, to remain independent, try to inform people, our audiences, uh, of the problems that the U.S. is facing uh, and also try to provide the best of information available. This is our goal. Yeah. Ali, thank you very much. Hussein, I'll go to you. Uh, uh, all right. So uh, the real question is, you know, how far does this go, right? Israel has received an enormous provocation. A, one of the, it's one of these spectacular, bloodthirsty, terrorist, overreaching attacks, right? I mean, we've seen this before. The United States received one on 9-11. It's happened historically time and again. Um, and the goal of such operations is always to provoke an emotional overreaction on the part of the targeted society. And that's what Hamas wants Israel to do. It wants it to overreact. If Israel is wise, what it will do is take whatever retaliatory measures it, it sees fit from the air and what have you, but it will avoid. Uh, and I mean, I obviously I agree with Ali that, you know, the the civilians need to be spared there's a horror of enormous proportions um but just to be analytical it's really important for israel's own self-interest and for the stability and security of the region that they resist the temptation to follow through on these ridiculous pronouncements like hamas de lende est well, they bought but stepped away from that hamas must be destroyed now it's hamas cannot be a sovereign entity on Israel's border. Well, that means reoccupation. It's a crazy idea, frankly. The wise thing to do would be to retaliate, even disproportionately given the Israeli doctrine, and stop. A restoration of some approximation of the status quo ante is in Israel's interests, in the interests of the Gulf countries, the interests of most of the parties, certainly in the interests of, of the people of Gaza, because any alternative is going to be worse for them. And uh, in the interests of the Palestinian national movement, it's really the wise thing to do. And it would allow uh, the region to continue with the process of de-escalation, etc. And I hope that's what happens, because an emotional overreaction by Israel is exactly what can set off this cascading series of events that Hamas is hoping for that um, totally overturns the general order in the region, may force uh, Hezbollah's hand, may drive Israel into a conflict with Iran, may create hugely destabilizing uh, conflicts, a very problematic long-term reoccupation of Gaza, a very bloody one. Uh, you know, this is extremely important for everybody to avoid, in my view. Thank you, Hussein. Christian, we'll give you the last word. Um, it's really hard to be given the last word, actually, in this current uh, context. Um, I think I would just say, again, uh, we're getting an unfortunately extremely bloody reminder um, that the Palestinian conflict is a difficult one to box up. I think there's been a real attempt to box it up, quite literally, um, in Gaza. Um, at the same time, we've been expanding in the West Bank, I think, um, to some degree, understandably, a lot of the regional states have been looking to their own national interest. Um, but we can see, again, that if this issue is uh, ignored, it can break out in these sort of unpredictable and, and, and horrific ways. So I don't know. I think like all of us, uh, we're probably just um, hoping for some some wisdom. And as Hussein said, uh, although it's extremely difficult, some sort of calculation of um, what's the best way to move forward and, and hoping for um the least bloodshed we can we can see as we're in this really difficult moment. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time. I want to thank the three of you for your very wise, considered analysis in an incredibly difficult and evolving situation. And I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. 
Um, we will be doing more on this topic in relations, as will many others. Uh, learn as much as you can about it. Stay tuned to us. You can see everything we have done on these and other topics at our website, agsaw.org, and on our social media uh, platforms. So thank you all very much. I hope to see you again at another program very soon.